OK, let's start. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Welcome to this talk. We are talking about product matching in the fashion industry. We are, I'm Alicia Perez. He is Javier Ordoña. And we both, oh, wait one second. I need the, sorry. ¿Dónde está? De la tres. OK, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was saying that um, we are both data scientists at StyleSage. And let me introduce a little bit what's StyleSage and why are we here talking about uh, fashion. StyleSage is an, an artificial intelligence power, uh, analytics tool, um, very focused on brands and retailers, and, they, and this platform helps them to make strategic decisions based on artificial intelligence and mainly focusing four types of analysis. First of one is pricing. We help them to see on which prices are their competitors and what, what are really their competitors. Another analysis is the assortment. We help them with the price, with the sizes and the um, products available or not, and again, to take uh, strategic decisions. We help them with the promotions, the marketing activities that their competitors are taking, and we also help them with the trends, with the influencers, and all the social media that now is so relevant for the fashion industry. And Javi and me as data scientists, our role in the company is mainly work with the data and reach them and try to generate new information. Um, luckily for us, StyleSage has more than four years of life and we are collecting data since the beginning. So we have a very huge database with many products. We have more than uh, uh, 400,000 million of products with different languages across different countries with text and images. And we are increasing our database uh, each week in one million more products. So we take this information, we apply different machine learning uh, strategies and pipelines as um, image recognition, uh, natural language processing, time series, with a big uh, tool of things in data science. And with this, we build the platform that we sell to our customers. And they can, uh, they can take all the, uh, all the decisions that I told you before. But here we are talking about product matching, and let me introduce the, the concept with the Bill Gates prediction. In 1999, Bill Gates uh, put some thoughts in a book. The book was called uh, Business at the Speed of Thought. And in this book, he, was, he thought about the future in the computer science in general and the technology. And back to 1999, it's extremely surprising how accurate th these predictions were. For example, he introduced some things that now are really normal for us, but back to 1999, it was totally uh, undiscovered, like the, the idea of a smartphone, the social media as Facebook, or the travel website, for example. And for me, it's extremely surprising that the number one of this prediction was this. Let me read it to say exactly the same word. It was something like, automated price comparison services will be developed allowing people to see prices across websites, making it effortless to find the cheapest product for all industries. And this was in 1999. And this is very related with our product matching. Product matching is something like this. You have the same product in two different websites. This is a real example in two different websites. And you need to know that it's exactly the same product. And it seems easy because we, as humans, has the superpower to infer features, to infer characteristics of, of, of images, mainly. So for me, based only on the image, I, I will say that it's the same product. And why? OK, because for me, the pattern is more or less the same. I don't know if you can see it clearly in the image, but it's a jeans pattern with dots. And yeah, I can imagine where are the, the hips of the model and the knees. So I can, I can say that it's more or less the same skirt length. And I will say that more or less the shape is the same because I can, I can imagine that this more or less fit in the hips and, and straight in the, in the lowest part. But actually for an algorithm based only in the raw image, it's not so easy because the color actually is not the same. The hexadecimal code probably is not the same. The shape is, is not the same in the image. And in the image, I cannot see clearly the whole body. I can, I can imagine. So 
yeah, it's not so easy. And if I try to help myself with the text, I'm not, it's not very helpful, because the only matching text in the, these two products is S. Oliver. That actually is the brand. It's not related with the skirt itself. It's not saying nothing about the skirt. And the other text is in different languages, and it's not, yeah, it's not very descriptive with the skirt. But why is it so important? Yeah, the first idea that we have in mind is this. As, as users, as customers of the, of the, of the web page, I want to know in which website is cheaper to, to, in order to buy it. And we can see that they have different discounts and different prices, even the original price is the same. But in StyleSeed, we work with brands and retailers. So for the brands and the retailers, this is really important, not only in this moment. They want to know the price strategy along the time. These are charts uh, from our platform. And you can see that this is not different only the, pr the price today. The price strategy is actually different in these two websites. In the first one, we have this product more or less discounted along the, along the time with no very big discount. But in the second one, it was full price almost all the time. And in the last weeks, they have a, an aggressive strategy for the price. So they need to know this in order to, to be able to react. And another goal could be the assortment, another of our analysis. It's, uh, you can see that this product is not available in all the sizes, but in the first one, we only have two sizes available with a very few products. And in the second one, we have available all the smaller, uh, all the smaller sizes. So yeah, the assortment is different. And the third one, is related not with the competitors, but in the inventory organization. For example, if you think in very big retailers as Walmart, Target, ASOS, they have a very huge inventory with many products that are provided by different brands, by different providers. And each brand probably is, is providing the data with different formats, with different fields, with different ways to, to, to serve the, the information. And they need to know if one product is actually in their inventory before including. Because if not, you will find the same product in the, web, in the same website with different information, with different price, and this will be confusing. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, benefits of product matching. And maybe you're thinking, OK, but this is a, a problem that is general in all the e-commerce business. And it's more or less solved with the universal codes. And yeah, for example, in technology, this is very common. But in fashion, it's not so common. It's very hard to find these codes in the websites. And let me show an, an example. This is a TV. This is exactly the information that I can find in a TV in the brand that is, um, that is doing this TV. And the first information that I find in the website is the code. And if I, I search for this code in Google, I have this product in many websites to buy and even in Google Shopping. But in fashion, it's not so easy. They try to hide these codes in order to avoid this type of analysis from their competitors. And one warning with that continue. We are talking about product matching. We are not talking about product similarity. Product similarity is other thing. Is try to find, based on one target, products with similar uh, features based on some, uh, on some things. It's a ranking of similarity, but we are not doing this. This is a very useful use case for, for all the industry in e-commerce and especially for fashion. But you need another approach to, for the solution and you have other benefits. And we are not talking about it. We are trying to find exactly the same product. Okay? So yeah, let's start with the solution. I will start with the first step that is prepare the data to be able to compare. Okay? The solution will be based in take, taking two products and let's try to figure out if it's the same. And if I want to compare something, I need that these things will be comparable. I need to compare apples with apples. And what I'm talking about, yeah, the information, as I said, in the website is unstructured. They have different uh, information available in different formats. For example, this is a product in Zara China. This is a product in one retailer in Europe. 
And for example, here you have very few texts. As you can see in these three examples, the images are different. For some products you have many images, for another you have only the product, you have the model in others. So yeah, we need to make this information structure in order to be able to compare. And we can start with an image-based classifier. I can take all the images and I can try to define a standard taxonomy. I can, I can define with the business team what is a dress, what is a shoe, what is a jacket, and I can try to put all these images inside of this category. I can try to fit the products based on the image. And for this, we are using deep neural networks. I know that we have been talking about uh, this topic a lot in this, uh, in this conference. I will only say that deep neural networks are uh, some piece of, so of, yeah, of code uh, organized as we think that our brain works. They are organized in layers and we have small pieces of software called neurons that actually are non-linear functions, they are connected one to each other, and the training process will do that de these connections will be a uh, strength if they are lead to success uh, to solve our problem and weak if they are not. So in the end, we have a distribution probability and we can use this probability in order to um, classify our images and classify our products. So let's say if I have this uh, image, I can classify them in the base category and I can say that this address. But I can use this approach for different taxonomies in order to have more information to find the match. I could say that the color is red, the print is, a, the pattern is a floral, the sleeve left, the neck left, the, I don't know if you have ruffles or not. I mean, you can track all this information and you can do this with this image and with the other images that we showed before. So we have the same attributes for all, and now we can compare. So for example, if I try to find in a very naive way if these two images are a match, I can use this approach to extract all the attributes that I need, and in the end, if they have the same attributes, maybe I could say that actually this is a match. But it's not so easy. Why? Because in fashion, sometimes you have the model with all the outfit. And only based on the image, I'm not able to say if we are talking about the jacket or the, or the pants or the shoes. So if I'm not able to say that, probably my algorithm will not be able as well. Sometimes for us it's confusing. Yeah, again, I'm not able to say if this is a pant or if this is a native wear cotton or a pyjama. I don't know. So probably it will be hard. And sometimes we have detailed image that they are not providing many information about what's the category of this product. So maybe I could help myself with the text. Again, the text is different with different languages and, and different uh, information available. So um, yeah, maybe I could use a, a, a similar approach. I could use a, um, a neural network. I could split the text into tokens. And I, I could try to figure out if some words has really relevant in some categories that, try and try to f that I'm trying to find. But again, it's not so easy. Because sometimes I have ambiguous descriptions, for example, winter jacket, but what kind of jacket? A puffer jacket, a bomber jacket, a blazer? It's not clear. And in the fashion industry, there are many ambiguous terms and there are uh, same spellings for the same for the same thing. For example, in materials and in sizes, this is very common. Sometimes we have two XL and sometimes we have XXL. So this is something that we need to take in account in our classifiers. And yeah, the missing data and inconsistent data is very common here. But if you take in account all these things, all these difficulties that you can find in your classifiers, you, you could do it and we are doing. Okay, in, you have in one side the product in the website and in the other side the structure uh, product as we have in the platform. So we have for all the products a title, uh, we have the brand, we have the price, we have the available colors. I mean, we structure this data for all the products and we have the same information. Well, sometimes you have missing information in some fields, but you can compare. You have uh, all the information that you need and now you can compare, okay? So for now, we are not solving the problem. We are only preparing the data in order to compare. And Javi will explain us how. Yeah. So 
now that we have the products in a standard taxonomy that we know how to extract this user information, we can start actually comparing the products, okay? So what is product matching from an algorithmic point of view? So the first thing you have to see is what is an instance or an example for our product matching model in terms of machine learning model. So this is not a, a good example, okay? As Alisa explained, we are not dealing with a product similarity problem here. We are dealing with a problem with a product matching. So we need products which are exactly the same. This example in here is a very similar dress. It's not the same dress. It's an excellent example for a product similarity problem, but it's not a good example for a product matching problem. We need this. We need exactly the same dress on two different catalogs. Okay. So that means that in terms of machine learning, this is a supervised binary classification task. Okay. It's supervised because for every two pair of product, we will have a single label. And it's binary because this label is either positive or negative. So two products are either are match or not. Okay? There is no point in between. So first thing we have to do is, now that we have these products in the standard taxonomy with the same dimensions or characteristic structure, we can start actually comparing the products. We can compute like individual similarity score for each one of these dimensions. So for the products, we have uh, the title extracted in the same way, we have the color, we have the material, we have the attributes. We can start working with that. So first thing, first thing we can do is to compare the title, the text. So as Alisa explained, we can transform the text into some kind of vector representation. And this is a bit of the scope of this talk, but the idea is we can use TF-IDF or a binary or a dictionary or maybe a neural network to transform the text into a vector. And one, we have the vectors, we can use some similarity distance of uh, distance functions to compute the distance between this vector, like the dot product or the Euclid and the Manhattan, the cosine. We can combine actually these different distances with the different ways we have to compute the vector, and that way we can get a bunch of different similarity scores just for the title. The next thing that we can compare are the colors. And in here we need like a first or preliminary step, which is how can we get the color. So either we can get the color directly from the image, like taking what is the color density, and that way we can have an hexadecimal code representing the color, or we can go to the title or text and check what is the name of the color, okay? Usually in here what we do is first to apply some kind of normalization process before, because sometimes we have really strange color names, like midnight blue, which is meaning dark blue. So, and once we have this color transformed, we can apply a dictionary, and we can transform this color name to a hexadecimal code, okay? So we can extra extract one or several colors per product. And once we have this hexadecimal code, then it comes the easy part. And I say it's easy because the distance between colors has been already solved by the International Commission of Illumination. So they have defined some formulas which are based on how humans perceive distance between colors. And we can apply these formulas to see what are the distance between one or several colors that we may have extracted from the product. And we can get also a bunch of similarity scores for the color. The next thing that we can compare is the material, okay? And these, for us, are discrete values. So what we do is to define positive or negative distance for the material. So in our case, we divide the materials into clusters or family. So our idea is if two products have the same mat have a material in common for the same family, then that is a positive distance. If one of them has a missing value, then that is a negative distance. And you can combine this logic also with the percentage of the material, so you have some kind of natural way to define the distance between the materials. Okay? That way you can get a similarity score for the materials between the products. The next thing we compare are the attributes. As Alisa explained, we can get the attributes from the title, from the text, from different fields, and the idea is you can get a bunch of attributes for a single product, but this is not always so easy because, I mean, Sometimes the attributes are not perfectly extracted, and you can have situations like this in which, because of the image, you are, maybe the algorithm is not sure about the length of the skirts, or because of the position of the arms, the algorithm is not sure about the length of the sleeve. So you may have attributes where are not being extracted in a correct way, so you may find this situation in which you have two products, which in principle they are matches, but you have some attributes which are not matching. Okay? So what we do in this case is to define a positive distance for the attributes which are matching, and the negative distance for those which are not, okay? And this can be also combined with the, some kind of natural sorting heuristic that we may have for the attributes. I mean, for us, as humans, it's kind of intuitive to see that a dress with a long sleeve will be closer than to a dress with a short sleeve rather than a dress with no sleeves, okay? So we can take advantage of this to define 
what will be the distance between these attributes, and also combine that with the confidence that we may obtain from the algorithm to define what is the distance between the attributes. And that way, we have a way to compute similar discourse for the attributes. Okay? And the last component that we can, or the last dimension that we can compare, are the images. And this is a very complex problem, which is a bit out of the scope of this uh, talk. But what we can say is one of the solutions to deal with this is the Siamese neural network, which are a specific way, a specific type of neural net. Indeed, Ruben Martinez, I mean, two talks ago, they talked about how to transform images into embeddings to compute the distance. Basically, we are doing the same thing. In the Siamese neural net, instead of having as input just one image, you have two images. These images are processed in parallel, and at the end, you get an embedding. Then you have a set of additional layers to compute what are the distances between those embeddings. So the result of this whole process is a score, an number which is a similarity score. Okay? This um, algorithm has to be trained like an independent machine learning model. So you need to define your training data, train the model, evaluate it independently, so on and so forth. And at the end, you have a system which is able to compare images, and you get a similarity score. So once you have the similarity score for all these dimensions, you can combine it all together, concatenating what we call a similarity vector. And the similarity vector is a pretty good approach about how close two products may be. Okay? And since we are dealing with a supervised problem, what you have to do is to associate a label to this vector. So in the case in which we have a positive case of a match, a positive match, the label will be positive. In the case we have a negative match, the label will be negative. Okay? But this is the perfect case. The case we have just seen is the case in which we have the product perfectly structured and we have all the dimensions. But this can also happen. Okay? We may have product where the image is not present on the website, maybe the color cannot be extracted, the material is also missing, or the attributes are quite poor. Okay? In those cases, this similarity vector will look like this. We will have a lot of missing values, we will have some gaps, and our systems will be ready and should be expecting to have to deal with these kind of problems. Okay? So which kind of algorithm do we use to deal with this? In our case, we use gradient boosted trees, which is a pretty standard algorithm in the industry. This algorithm is based on trees, which a tree is just like a bunch of rules, which relate the feature vector to the label. Okay? And this algorithm will create like several independent trees, like small trees called weak learners, which relate the feature for the label for the specific cases. And these trees are combined into a meta tree or big tree, which is called the ensemble model. And this model is a pretty good approach for this problem because it's a very robust model, can deal pretty well with the missing features or the gaps. Also, it's pretty good dealing with a balanced data. And the product matching problem is a very unbalanced problem by nature because it's much, much easier to find negative cases of matches rather than positive cases. It's really hard to find matches to train your model. So that, uh, that algorithm can deal pretty well with that. Also, it's in general, it's a good first approach for any machine learning problem. You will see that in Kaggle is a very popular method. And in our case, we have used the implementation called HGBoost. Okay? So now that we have the feature vector and the model, we have to think about how to train our model. Because as I said, it's really difficult to find good matches. So what do we do? We apply like a semi-supervised approach or intermediate step. So how does this work? We take an image with several, a pro sorry, a product with several images, like we can find in a website. And we take some of these images from the same product, and we treat an image-based similarity algorithm. Okay? As I said, I mean, we're not trying to solve a product similarity problem. But for this case, like an intermediate step, is a good approach to start your model up and running in a cheap way. Okay? So when we take these images, we can train an image-based similarity problem, image-based similarity model, sorry. And we have something like this. We have some products which are similar, maybe they are not the same, but they're close enough to be considered like pseudo matches. From those, we chose those which are pretty close to be a match, and those will define the positive instance for our model. Okay? As I said, this is not going to be the final data we are going to use to train our model, but this is a good approach for something enough to have a first iteration of our model. Okay? So now that we have the data, we can start thinking about how to evaluate this model. And keep in mind the following. As I said, this problem is a very unbalanced problem by nature. And this is what I mean. If you have this case in which you have two catalogs with a 30% overlap, in this case, we have dresses. That means that we have three dresses on belonging to both catalogs. Okay? 
if you try to compute how many different pairwise combinations we may have, that means that we will have three pairs which are matches and 87 which are not. Okay? This is what I mean by having a very unbalanced problem. So if we transfer this into this, in which we have a catalog or a set of pairs uh, where three of them are matches and 12 of them are not matches, and we try to solve this using a very vast model, a very useless model, which saying that everything is not a match, that model will predict currently 12 out of the 15. Okay? If we try to measure this using the accuracy, the accuracy of that model will be an 80%. That means that accuracy is not a proper metric for this problem. We cannot use accuracy. What is a much better metric for this? So what we need is a model saying that this subset are matches. Okay? So from there, we can, we can uh, check how many of those are actually matches, and that is the precision. And also we can check, okay, from the matches we detected, how many of them we left outside, and that is the recall. Okay? So precision and recall are much better metric to measure the performance of our model rather than the accuracy, which is useless in our case. Okay? So now we have the model, we can start thinking about deploying this model. So first thing we have to keep in mind, and just consider the, follow, the following situation of this number. These numbers come from a real matching process we are running in our company right now. So on one half, one half we have one retailer with 850,000 products. On the other hand, we have a retailer with 380,000 products. If you try to compute if every possible pair is either a match or not, so you can try to compute all the possible pair with combinations, you have that number. So if your model is computing whether a pair is a match or not, in a tenth of a second, that will take 1,000 years. So this is not feasible. It's a problem which is not tractable. You have to do something about this, okay? So what do we do? Going back to the problem before with the dresses, what we do is to match only those products we have in common, the brand, the gender, and the category, okay? That way you can reduce a lot the dimensionality of, the, of this problem, and you have something like this, like a small cluster of products which are the same brand, gender, and category, and then you have a problem which is tractable, okay? You don't need to do this number of matches anymore. So what else can we do when we are deploying this, this, this model? Okay, we can apply some heuristic of the domain on top of the prediction of our model. So something useful that we found is, in order to, to check if a match predicted by the model is actually a match or a false positive, there are some rules that we can apply. The first one is about the colors. And that means that if you have within a match two products with a very rare color names, and these color names are not matching, that is very likely not to be a match, it's going to be a false positive, like in this case. You have a dress whose color is midnight blue, and this product is also available in sea blue and sky blue, and this product is matching against another one which is blue, but this product is also available in midnight blue. That means that the match will be midnight blue against midnight blue. Okay, so that is a pretty good indicator that you are dealing with a false positive. Something similar happened with the material. If your system is able to extract the material in a perfect way, and you have the 100% material for both products and this percentage is not matching correctly, that is very likely not to be a match. It's another, it's another way to find that this is going to be a false positive. Okay? And something similar happens with the price. Although some of the idea, I mean, some of the goals of the whole system is to compare prices. If you have a match with very, very, very different prices, that is very rare. Okay? So it's very likely that that product is not, not, not going to be a match, so you will need to do something about that. Apart from this, there are some tips that we can share, like, for instance, as Alisa says, uh, within this domain, the codes are very rare, are quite difficult to extract, and we will suggest not to rely on the codes. So the codes for this domain are pretty useless. Okay? In our case, we only have a 50% of the products with a code, with a barcode. Another thing we have to think about is when we are defining the cluster to reduce or to deal with the scalability of the problem, what is the granularity of these clusters? In some cases, for some category, it makes sense to have like a very small cluster or very granular cluster like the genes, because genes are pretty easy to detect within the uh, trousers domain or trousers category. But in other cases, like the dresses, maybe it makes sense not to have so granular cluster like party dresses. Maybe it makes sense to have something like dresses, because party dresses are not so different from dresses. So it's something you have to think about when you are deploying a system like this. Okay? And just to finish this talk, some lessons that we have learned over the 
past few months. The first one is, as you may imagine, having a standard taxonomy and a proper way to extract the characteristic of the product is key in this problem. Without the common taxonomy, it's almost impossible to perform a good product matching. Okay? The second one is that the tools to visualize and understand your data and to debug your code is really, really important. In this domain, it's very, I mean, in general, it's quite tricky and it's very easy to have false positive and false negative. So you need a way to control that and to visualize that. Also, the codes, the barcode, especially the universal codes, are very scarce, but that's really, really useful. If you have those, trust them and use them to generate your training data. It's a cheap way to get uh, training data up and running quite easily. The uh, next one is that, at least in our case, at the end, we end up using a lot of more QLT assurance than we expected. And as I said, it's a very tricky problem. It's very easy to have mistakes. And if you aim to increase the precision and the recall at the same time, you need a proper quality assurance pipeline to check all these uh, errors. Okay? And the last one is kind of transversal across all machine learning problems, and is that the feature you use to compute the similarity and the data you use to train your model is much more important than the model that you are using. In our case, we are using gradient boosted tree, which, I mean, they work pretty well, but we also tried with neural nets, and the differences are not really statistically significant. The differences coming from the features and the data. Okay? And that's all. Thank you very much. If you have any questions? services you provide in some cases are, I mean, some companies approaching you to, to do a matching of their products with someone else, some other website. That o other website might not be contacting you. So how do you extract data from those other websites? We extract data as Google will do, basically. We, I mean, all the data which is public can be extracted. I mean, we have a bunch of spiders basically doing that for us. So we have a whole backend team dealing with that, basically extracting the data and moving that data into a database. And this is kind of previous to this whole thing, but this is like, like Google can do. OK. OK, thanks. OK. Thank you. Thank you.